live here. I'm so excited to be with you today. Even if we have to do it in this online medium, I'm so grateful that you're here. We just want to encourage you to be faithful to get on here and watch these videos. Uh, if you uh, have the chance, maybe call somebody and encourage them to watch online. At least we can get into God's word and get some nourishment this way. If you know someone that doesn't know Christ, this would be a good video to share with them as well. I want to continue to uh, encourage you to be um, faithful in your giving. You can give online at our at our church website, and we'll put the link up on the uh, Facebook uh, comments below, or also uh, put the URL up here so that you know how you can get there. You and I both have a problem. Anybody, everybody watching this video has a problem that they've got to deal with or that they have to have already dealt with at some point. I know this because it's a problem that everybody faces. Uh, we don't like to think about this problem, but it literally shows up in little ways every day of our lives. It shows up on our faces as wrinkles. It shows up in our bodies as we get older with aches and pains. It's the reason we have security systems and seat belts and car locks and and weapons of all kinds and hospitals and medicine and clothing and seat belts and on and on I could go. This problem is something that you can't get away from and it's a problem that we've even dealt with in our own church this week and the problem that we're talking about that all of us will face is the problem of death. Now I know that's not a very encouraging way to start a sermon. But this issue of death affects us, every one of us. The, it's been in the news a lot. We faced it, like I said, in our church this week. One out of one people die. Everybody dies. The Bible said it's appointed unto man once to die, then after this, the judgment. You can make a lot of money, have all kinds of power and success, but you still have to face death. Young people die, old people die, sick people die, healthy people die, rich people die, poor people die. Everybody deals with it. Is there anything you can do about it? Is there any remedy? I, I know that this doesn't sound super encouraging, but today I want to give you hope because the Bible is very clear about it. I know many of you that are watching know Christ as your Savior, and, and that's a good thing. Today, I want to be very upfront with you. I want to be encouraging and I want to give you hope. There's, this is a very, very simple message, but it's going to be very direct. The only hope you and I have is in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your only shot at, at dealing with death in a way that brings life. Today, I want to be short. I want to be compelling and I want to be clear. And I want to make the point of this sermon, the point of the narrative bit of text that we're going to read today. Uh, and I'm going to share with you in John chapter number 11. The response that John wants the reader, the, the gospel of John, the writer John wants the reader to have as he reads this particular passage is the same response that he wants for the, reading the whole book, but it's particularly uh, true in this particular passage. And that is the response of belief in Jesus. John wants the reader that, he's talking to to believe in Jesus because that was Jesus's intention. We will see that in a minute. That's the response that I, the response that I want you to have today is this belief in Jesus. And if, if you already know Christ as your savior, I want you to have a more assurance of your faith, right? I, I want you to, uh, I want your faith to grow through reading this text. The, oh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if you're here today and you just happen to get onto this stream and you don't know for sure what's going to happen to you after you die, this message is for you. It's so important that you know this. And so we're going to see three truths about Jesus uh, that will serve as reasons as to why you should believe in Jesus. You should believe in Jesus Christ today for three reasons. Number one, Jesus is in control. We're going to look at John chapter number 11. In your Bible. We're just going to walk through this passage of scripture and I hope that it'll be an encouragement to you and I hope that at the end of this that you will believe and be assured of heaven as your home. Jesus had made a difference in the lives of so many people 
on his earthly ministry. You, we, we know that there were crowds. We know that there were lots of people that came to see Jesus as he, heals, as he healed people. But Jesus also had, out of those crowds, people that kind of became a part of a group of people that would be called his disciples. People that, uh, not the 12 disciples, but people that loved him and, and were followers of him. Uh, there, were, there were the 12, but even at the end of his ministry, we know that there were way more than 12 in that upper room because there were other people that followed and loved and knew Jesus. There was a family, uh, this a, a brother and two sisters. You've heard of them, maybe, maybe not. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And that's who this lesson is about today. That's who this particular passage is about today. Look, look with me, if you will, um, in verse 1. It says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest, talking about Lazarus, is sick. So these two sisters probably for sure were, were, were excited. Of course, they were dealing with the fact that their brother was sick and apparently got so bad that they wanted to get it addressed. And they were so um, excited, I'm sure, at some point to know that one of their friends, Jesus, who had so clearly shown love to Lazarus uh, that they would call him the one you love, uh, this one Jesus, he was able to heal the sick. They knew that he had healed all kinds of people. So they send word to Jesus to say, hey, our brother's sick and kind of implying, hey, why don't you come and heal him? Verse four, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, this is very interesting. This is Jesus showing his omniscience, his his the fact that he's in control. Here Jesus says something, really it's supernatural, that he would know that this particular sickness would not end in Lazarus's death. Now, here's a spoiler, a little bit for the story. We do know that Lazarus ended up dying even before the end of this story. But the, but we're going to see something incredible. This, this story doesn't end in Lazarus being dead. <laughs> this story ends up with him being alive. And he says, this sickness has come into Lazarus's life so that God would be glorified through Jesus, so that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. But what I want you to see is that Jesus knew exactly how this would turn out. Then, then John says something very interesting. He says in verse 5, Now Jesus loved Mary and Martha, sorry, just loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. I think that's really interesting. Why would he point out? Why would he say, Hey, just so you know, they, they thought he loved them, but I want you to know Jesus really did love this family. I think the reason he put that in here is because of what Jesus was about to say in verse 6. Verse 6, when he had heard that he was sick, when he, Jesus, had heard, therefore, that Lazarus was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Jesus had the power to heal. Everybody knew that. That's why these women had sent these messengers to Jesus. Hey, come on, Jesus. We, we want you to, to come see our brother. So Jesus stayed. It says he stayed two more days. Why would he do that? Well, I want, I want to submit to you that Jesus knew what was going on and going on. And Jesus was even in control of what would happen. He had a plan because he's in control, because he is God. That's what we want you to see. He goes on in verse 7, says, Then after that, he says to the disciples, this is two days later, at least. Let's go down to Judea again. At least two days later, he says to the disciples, let's go back. Now, they, they reminded Jesus, the disciples, that, hey, the last time you were there, Jesus, these religious leaders, these people that are in charge now, they wanted to stone you. But Jesus told him, hey, not to worry, be safe. Why? Because he's in control and that they would be safe. He then tells them why he wants to go. Look at verse 11. Then said he, after he had said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of, out of his sleep. <laughs> the, uh, the, he says to them, hey, Lazarus is asleep, but we're, I'm going to go wake him up. 
Notice the sovereignty in the statement. Jesus was not down there with Lazarus, but he's making a definitive statement that Lazarus is asleep. Now the disciples, they, they say, if he's asleep, he'll do well. Like Jesus, he must be doing okay if he's asleep and he's getting rest. But they didn't know what Jesus really meant. It says in verse 13, how be it Jesus spake of his death. So Jesus is saying, Lazarus is dead. How would Jesus know this? Jesus knows this because he's in control. Jesus knows this because he's the son of God. He's omniscient. It says in verse 13, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And that's why I brought up death. This is dealing with the problem of death, right? Verse 15, this is interesting. Here he follows up, Lazarus is dead. We know that he loves Lazarus. We know that he has the ability to heal. Now he's telling, we know that he stayed two more days. Now he's telling his disciples, Lazarus is dead. And then he says this, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. I'm glad, you're glad for us, Jesus. <laughs> we're the disciples, We've, we, we're following you. We're, we're, we're watching everything you do. Why are you glad for us, right? He says, I'm glad for your sake that I was not there. Because you already believe, this, this is my interpretation, you already believe that I can heal the sick, but you're going to see something different. I want you to believe. It says, verse 15, And I am glad that you are that I was not there to the intake that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Here we have an insight into why Jesus is doing everything that he's doing. Jesus is timing his response to Lazarus' circumstance in such a way that this difficult circumstance would end in their belief. He was orchestrating this whole thing so that people would believe, starting with his disciples. Right? This is what he's trying to do. Verse seven, look at verse 17. It says this, Then when Jesus came, he found out that he had lain in the grave four days already. Verse 18. So, so he's pretty dead. I mean, he's been in, in the grave for 14, four days. Verse 18. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. Now that's interesting. Do you know how far 15 furlongs is? 15 furlongs is about two miles. Two miles. Now I'm not saying as I'm as fast as I used to be, but I think I could get two miles down the road and walking in less than a day, maybe half a day, for sure, for sure. Could a healthy middle-aged adult walk at a pace of about two miles an hour? I, I think that's possible. What do you think the disciples would have thought about the fact that they're only two miles away? Jesus could have gone very easily to Lazarus, but he didn't do it. It may not have looked like Jesus was responding correctly to them. They may have had reason to doubt Jesus. Well, Jesus, why aren't you, you love him? Why aren't you going? They may not have thought that he was in control. If you look at verse 19, it says, Many of the Jews came to Mar Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary stayed, st stayed sat still in the house. Then Mary said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been there, my brother had not died. Here's Martha who had sent a message to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, the one you love is sick. Knowing that Jesus had the power to forgive, probably having found out that he's less than two miles away. He's less than 15 furlongs off. And here it is, at least a few days later, here's Jesus coming. And she has the natural question that you and I would have. Jesus, why are you just now showing up? Why do you seem so late? If you would have been here, she had at least enough faith to believe that Jesus would, you would have healed my my brother, you've healed so many people. You claim to love us and to love our brother. Why didn't you come? Did you get our message? We know you got our message. Why didn't you come? If it was your brother and you were in this circumstance, the temptation would be to, to ask these kind of questions. But notice what else Martha said. I think it's very interesting. In verse 22, she says this, but I know that even now, 
whatsoever thing you will ask of God, God will give it thee. Here's a hint towards belief, right? To hint toward a belief beyond what you already believe. It's as if she was saying, I believe you can still work, Jesus. And Jesus responds to her. He kind of takes the bait. He says in verse 23, Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. What was Jesus telling her? He, he was telling her that your wildest dream could come true. That, that what you want most in this moment, your brother back, is possible. In this moment, what, what did Martha want more than her brother to be alive and back with her? Nothing, right? Jesus was prom promising her a resurrection. She believed it, but, but then she put it in the realm of her own possibility. She says in verse 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She's basically saying, yeah, I, I know that the, the Old Testament, she would have called it the Old Testament, but the Bible, the, the scriptures teach that there will be a resurrection at the last day. She's like, I already know this is within my doctrine, Jesus. Yeah, doctrinal check. I know Lazarus will resurrect when we all resurrect at death, but that doesn't comfort me right now. <laughs> I, I, I want him now, right? That's probably what, what she's thinking. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. And then Jesus makes this is a very interesting claim. It's, it's the, the title of this message. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. You, you see that? You don't have to wait for a resurrection. I am the resurrection. I am the life, Jesus says. The resurrection in the last days will be possible because of Jesus Christ. And for Martha, the resurrection of her brother was possible because of Jesus. And today I want you to know that resurrection and life are possible for you today, but only in Jesus Christ. He is the one who can defeat death. Why? Because he's in control. He is absolutely in control. Notice the rest of that verse. Jesus said in her, I am the resurrection of life. He that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever that means anybody whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die believest thou this now i want you to notice how many times belief came up in that he says do you believe this right if he that believeth in me, he who puts their trust in me, the resurrection and the life, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. There's a sense in which those who know Christ as Savior, those who believe will never die. Why? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Death in the biblical sense is separation from God. That's, how he's, that's what he's talking about here. Those who believe in Jesus will never be separated from the love of God. They'll never be separated from God. Even though their body may die, they will be very, very much alive. Those people that we've lost uh, here recently in, in life, those people that we love so much, we don't, if they knew Christ, and, and certainly some of those ones that we know in our church that have died, that we know they knew Christ, and we haven't lost them. We know exactly where they are. They're having a great day because Jesus is in charge. Jesus is in control. And he is the resurrection and the life. In this circumstance, Jesus was bringing all of this to a point where he could be glorified. How? How can he be glorified? By belief in who he is. By the disciples. By Martha by all who would see him work and ultimately for us who would read about what happened even today. And so the question for Martha is the question for us today. Do you believe that Jesus is in control? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that eternal life is even possible? Here's Mar Martha's answer. She saith unto him, yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. 
2020 has been a difficult year. It's a year when there's been a great temptation for us to look at the circumstance and respond with questions. God, how, why are you allowing this to happen, right? God, don't you see what those people are saying about you? God, don't, don't you really love us? Do you, don't you really see that we're hurting? There can be so much doubt when we go through difficulty. But today I want you to know that Jesus is in control. He is still on the throne. And he's more interested in our character than in our comfort. He's interested in growing our faith. The, he is called, we're called according to his purpose that we would be conformed to the image of his son, God, talking about God, that God would conform us to make us more like his son and more, he's more interested in getting us uh, to be what he wants us to be than getting us through this circumstance. When you're tempted to doubt that Jesus is out of control, don't give in to that temptation. Jesus made it possible for you to be here today to hear this truth. God's desire is for you to believe so that you can know eternal life. Why? Well, let's look at this second reason why you should believe in Jesus. Number two, Jesus loves us. You should believe in Jesus, not just because he's in control, but because he, he loves you. I want you to see that here. In verse 30, it says, now, when Jesus was not yet coming to the town, he was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goeth unto the grave to weep there. This is Martha's sister Mary, and she must have gotten up out of the house and gone to the grave. These other people are following her. So it says in verse 32, then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. It's the same, the same statement that Martha said to him. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which were with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, this very famous verse says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Here's a truth you need to know. Jesus knew the miracle he was about to do. He had already told us Lazarus, this, the sickness of Lazarus would not end in death, but that, the, that God would get the glory, that the Son of Man would be glorified. But in the midst of this difficulty, Jesus was grieved in the spirit. He groaned in the spirit and he wept because of what he saw. He understood the grief that these people are feeling because of the effect of sin. You see, the Bible says, the soul that sins, it will die. The wages of sin is death. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And in this moment, he felt the weight of that in the specific circumstance of these people. In this moment, he had a love for those that were there to the point that it moved him to tears. It, it moved him so much that it was notable to people that were there. In verse 36, it says, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. But then they were, it's so interesting. They, they said, oh man, it's obvious he loved Lazarus. Verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? They, they, they felt a gap between the fact that they knew that Jesus loved this family, but then they weren't sure why. Then he didn't come and heal them. He didn't do something about that. Friend, I'm telling you today, you may be in the midst of a very difficult circumstance. Maybe you're one of these ones that have lost a loved one. Maybe you're at home feeling the sickness, you know, maybe, maybe you're home suffering and in pain. M maybe you're someone who loves this country very much and you see a lot of what's happening in this country, some of the corruption that's happening and some of the things that, that are going on and you might be tempted to think, God, what are you doing? Do you not love us? I want you to, t I want to tell you today, God loves you so much. Jesus loves you. And in this moment, we do not have a savior that's not, uh, that does not feel the feelings of our infirmities but was like the Bible says, in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. This is a God who weeps with us. This God loves us. If you're here today and you don't know what will happen to you when you die, you need to know 
that God has made a plan for you because he loves you. This plan was to send his son, Jesus. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, won't die, but have everlasting life. You should believe in Jesus today because Jesus is in control. Number one. Number two, because Jesus loves us. And number three, because Jesus alone defeats death. <laughs> we asked at the beginning of the sermon, is there a remedy? And I want to tell you very much, uh, This, I want to tell you with all the passion I have, Jesus defeats death. And he's the only one that can do it. Look at verse 38. Jesus, therefore, groaning in himself, coming to the grave. It was a cave and the stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Man, God, Jesus, are you seriously taking the stone away? He, he's starting to decompose. He's, he's, he's got to smell. What are you doing? He's been dead for four days. Verse 40. Jesus saith unto her, and this is key. Don't let this go by just as a, a dialogue in the story. Jesus says to Martha, Said not I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? What Jesus says in this moment is, Martha, don't you see this whole thing is about you believing and you seeing what only God could do, the glory that God wants to reveal. He cared about her faith. Remember, the question is the same question for us. Do you believe. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hast heard me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. <laughs> there it is again. Jesus wanted them to believe very clearly who he was, that he was the son of God, that God the Father had sent him to do what he was doing. Why? He's saying it to God the Father in their earshot so that they would believe. What's his, what's his, what does he care about? That we would believe. Verse 43. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Before I go on, I want to say to you, that this miracle we're about to see, it really is not the most incredible miracle in the Bible. What do, what do I mean? The Bible says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It, said, it says in John chapter one about Jesus, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything that made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men, right? Uh, G Jesus was active in creation. God created the world. And if God could make the whole world come into existence, ex nihilo, out of nothing, then bringing someone back from the dead is really no problem, right? If he created everything, then bringing one person from the dead is not a, not a big deal for him. But he's the only one that could do it. He says, Lazarus, come forth, verse 44, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, loose him and let him go. Jesus Christ raised the dead. <laughs> he raised Lazarus. It has often been said that it was a good thing that he said, Lazarus come forth and not just come forth, because otherwise there would have been many coming, more coming out of the graves. I know that this is at least possible, why? Because Jesus is the only one that can raise the dead. <laughs> the other night, uh, my wife and I were watching a, it was actually last Sunday uh, afternoon, we were watching a, a movie uh, and Zeke was in the room with us, my son Zeke. And in the movie, uh, there is this uh, car crash and this woman uh, was laying on the ground in this car crash and it was kind of going in slow motion and Zeke was not really watching the movie But he's playing the little video game But he looked up and he saw this woman on the ground and he said, oh, no, is she dead? and uh, 
before we could respond, you know, saying, well, she's not totally dead, but she's obviously about to die. He saw a bunch of these paramedics, again, in the movie coming to her. And he said, oh, the ambulance guys, they can make her better. They can make her alive again. Can they make her alive again? <laughs> and uh, we said something about how the yeah, ambulance guys can help revive or help sustain life, right? Uh, to help make her better. And how it is when you're trying to explain truths to a kid, he's kind of half listening and half not. And it was kind of interesting when at that time in the movie, they put those uh, defibrillators, those things that shock the heart. And so when they put that on there, he goes, what's that? I said, oh, they're going to shock her. They're going to, that's how it kind of gets her heart going. She goes, oh, she goes, he goes, oh, and it was almost like this moment of, okay, now I finally understand what you've been trying to tell me. He says, oh, she just needs recharged. <laughs> you see, my, my son uses all kinds of electronic devices. And when the device is dead, when the device is out of power, we say, oh, it's dead. It needs to be charged up. And so in his little mind, when he saw this dead person, and he saw the electric things going on there. He's just going, oh, she just, she's just out of battery. She just needs to get charged up again. <laughs> Can I tell you, though, as silly as that illustration is, it illustrates a point. We, we as people, we as human beings, we can't create life. We can't resurrect life. You and I have a problem. The wages of sin is death. And you can't plug us in and recharge us. Because of sin, we deserve eternal death, eternal separation from God. And the only one that can give us resurrection life is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And the question for you today is the question that he asked Martha, and that's, do you believe this? Will you respond like many of the Jews that were there this day? It says in verse 45, there at the end, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen this thing, the things which Jesus did, believed on him. That was the point. The point of him, them going through all this circumstance was so that people would believe in him. Will you respond like Martha? Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You see, this Jesus who raised others from the dead, when he had sacrificially given his life for our sins, he rose again from the dead himself. And he defeated sin and death and hell and the grave. So the Bible says that if you would believe that in that heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confessions made of salvation. And just to make it really simple for all of us, it says down there in verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friend, I want you to know today, if you're going through a difficult circumstance and you know Christ is your savior, I want you to know, you don't know the end of the story. And although you may be tempted to think, God, what are you doing? Why are you letting this happen? I want you to know that God has a plan. God's not out of control. He's still on the throne. God does not, uh, has not abandoned you. He does not, his love for you has not waned. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He loves you very much. And he is the one that will bring about what is best in your life for you. If you're here and you don't know Christ as your savior, I want you to know that your one shot at heaven, your one shot at eternal life is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But he who but does not believe is condemned already, the Bible says, because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Would you today take just a moment and call on the Lord to save you? When I was... Nine years old, I prayed a prayer like this, and it wasn't a magic prayer, but it was a prayer that expressed faith in God. Uh, it went something like this, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that you sent Jesus to die for me, and God, I'm asking today that you would 
forgive me of my sin. Not any one particular sin, but all my sins. That you would save me. That you would give me eternal life. God, you said if I would call to you for salvation, you would save me. So I'm, I'm, I'm trusting in you and what your son did on the cross to save me from my sin. God, thank you for saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed a prayer like that, if you called on the Lord to save you, I want you to know that if you meant business with God, God said, Jesus said, he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you turn from your sin today to Christ by faith, the Bible says your sins are forgiven. If you have questions, you would like to talk to somebody, we're putting the email and the phone number for the church up on this video. We'd love to hear from you this week. We'd love to know how we can help you take next steps in your walk with the Lord. God, I love you today and I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the resurrection life that is possible because of the resurrection of the Son of God. And I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that you're a God who's in control. And so God, I pray that if there's someone who needs to make this decision today, that they would make it and that they would... Uh, let us know about it and help us to help them take the next steps towards uh, their walk with the Lord, their relationship with you. We love you and thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. Come back tonight at five o'clock. We'll have another sermon uh, from God's Word. Be here together on Facebook Live. Thank you.